Hello everyone and welcome to the nervous system lecture. Starting out, we are going to discuss nervous tissue. We've talked about this very briefly before, um, but we do want to talk about um, what all of these structures within nervous tissue are. First and foremost, a nerve cell is going to be called a neuron. They're going to be cells that carry electrical and chemical signals back and forth between the brain and other parts of the body. We have neuroglia next, which are going to be these little supporting cells that surround the neuron. The cell body or the soma is this large structure here. And inside of the soma, we're going to have the nucleus. Dendrites are next. They are these smaller kind of structures uh, emitting off of our cell body. And then last but not least, we have our axon. The axon is going to be this longer structure coming off of our cell body. And the difference between dendrites and axons is that dendrites are going to be more like ears while the axon is going to be more like a mouth or a talking piece. So the dendrites are going to receive information from other axons while the axon is going to take that information and send it out. Here I just want you to know a few of these terms. For the axon, I want you to know that this whole thing here is the axon, and I want you to know the axon hillock. You don't have to know any of those other terms. I do want you to know dendrites, dendritic spines were just smaller little structures branching off of the dendrite itself, mitochondria, the nucleus, know that the nucleolus is going to be found in the nucleus. Uh, you don't need to know nissel bodies, I want you to know cell body, and that's it. The nervous system, not unlike the uh, skeletal system as well as the muscular system, is going to be split into the axial versus sort of the rest of the body. Um, so the central nervous system is going to just include the brain and spinal cord, while the peripheral nervous system is pretty much everything else that radiates off of the central nervous system. Um, and this is going to include both sensory and motor uh, nerves. Specifically, the peripheral nervous system is going to split up into two subsections. The somatic nervous system is going to be where the faculty of bodily perception is uh, happening. Uh, it is your sensory system, so make sure you know that specifically. It is sensory. It's also going to control your voluntary movement. The autonomic nervous system is going to be uh, your involuntary control and visceral function. And anytime you see this term visceral, I want you to think organs. Specifically, one set of organs is going to have its own sort of special uh, autonomic subsection uh, of, of a nervous system, and that is the enteric nervous system, or the ENS. So the enteric nervous system is going to have everything to do with your digestive tract. It is a mesh-like uh, set of neurons that is going to govern the functions of your digestive tract. Because there's just so much going on there, it kind of needs its own thing. So this is just a nice graphic showing the subdivisions of the peripheral nervous system. Um, it's just kind of interesting. You don't have to memorize it. It's just a nice graphic. Again, another nice graphic. Uh, and if my little video wasn't in the way, um, that bottom box there would be smooth muscle, cardiac muscle, glands, and adipose tissue. So things that you don't control, um, are good examples those are. Neurons are going to be classified by their functions. Um, there are three that we are going to discuss. Uh, specifically, the first one is going to be your sensory or afferent neurons, so make sure you pay attention to this spelling. 
These neurons are going to detect changes in your environment, which is called stimuli. So anytime there's something that is going to change your environment, this could be temperature, this could be pressure, this could be um, dry versus wet, it just kind of depends. Uh, this could also be pain, um, so some type of impact. That is stimuli. We are going to then transmit this information to the brain or spinal cord. So we are starting off here on the first step, our sensory or afferent neurons conducting a signal from receptors and sending them to the central nervous system where they are going to then be processed by interneurons. Interneurons are going to be our association neurons and they lie between the sensory and motor pathways in the central nervous system. 90% of our neurons are interneurons, and these are going to process, store, and retrieve information. Specifically, in this case, we are going to process this information. So this is where we are right now. From there, we are going to uh, use our motor or efferent neurons uh, to send out a signal in how to respond to the stimuli that we had before. Uh, so this is outgoing information from our interneurons. And this is going to go to maybe a muscle or a gland cell, which are called effectors. These organs are then going to carry out a response. So the example I like to use on this next slide, using all of this information that we have, is that we have some type of stimuli. Let's say... Um, I'm standing in front of you, and for some reason, I decide to slap you in the face. Um, I don't promote violence, but in this case, it's kind of a, a fun thought process. So let's say I slap you in the face. That is the stimuli, that slap, that hit to the face. Um, so what might happen is uh, that information is then sent from our sensory or afferent neurons to our interneurons, so your central nervous system, so your brain or your spinal cord, whatever uh, is going to respond first and process that information. It is going to send out information saying, ow, that hurt recoil, or like kind of duck back, something like that. And your effector is then going to perform that task. You can also think of the example of like touching a hot stove. Uh, so you have that, that heat as the stimuli. That information is then passed on through your sensory to the interneurons. There, it's going to go to your motor neuron saying, ouch, that hurts, move your hand. And so then those muscles are then going to move your hand away from whatever that hot stove or hot pot or plate is. Do keep in mind that this whole process is going to happen instantaneously, incredibly quick. So as long as it takes me to explain it, it happens in, in a fraction of that time. Next up, we have the term neurotransmitters. And this big long paragraph here is just a very nice um, summarized explanation of what neurotransmitters are. They are a chemical substance that is released at the end of a nerve fiber by the arrival of a nerve impulse and by diffusing across the synapse or junction causes the transfer of the impulse to another nerve fiber muscle fiber or some other structure. And we've talked about neurotransmitters before. Um, we talked about them when we talked about the neuromuscular junction and specifically acetylcholine. Acetylcholine is a wonderful example of a neurotransmitter. So that is going to be uh, the neurotransmitter that bridges that gap and carries that signal uh, from a neuron to your muscle fibers. Now, neurotransmitters are going to be released from neuron to neuron, essentially, as a signal is carried down uh, from neuron to neuron. And in order to stop that stimulation, so to stop that process of neurotransmitters being released, uh, we have to either use enzymes or a process called reabsorption or another process called reuptake. This means that those neurotransmitters are going to be used again. So it's a lot like recycling or upcycling in a way too. These are all examples of neurotransmitters. Uh, you have acetylcholine and where it will be found in the central and peripheral nervous system, norepinephrine 
is going to be found in both as well. And then the rest are going to be just found in the central nervous system. Examples include epinephrine, serotonin, glutamate, and gamma aminobutric acid. And uh, specifically with serotonin, it is also used in um, your emotions, mood, and body temperature. And glutamate is going to assist in your memory and learning. So sometimes, and quite a lot of times, in uh, your body, the various structures, various chemicals, various hormones, um, they serve multiple purposes. And you'll see that as sort of a uh, pattern as we go through the various systems and the different physiologies of various structures. So neurotransmitters serve um, quite a few functions. They don't just serve one function typically. Here we have a nice graphic uh, showing a presynaptic neuron and a postsynaptic neuron. And specifically the vesicles that are holding a uh, neurotransmitter and then being released into the synapse or this little synaptic cleft where these uh, neurons are not touching, remember, that is the cleft. So these neurotransmitters are then uh, kind of moving across that synapse and to the receptors waiting on the postsynaptic neuron. So this stimuli is going to come down the presynaptic neuron. It's going to stimulate the vesicles to release the neurotransmitters. That's going to bridge that gap, pop into those receptors, and then that information is going to keep being passed on along the postsynaptic neuron. And that is how a signal is, uh, is moving across your neurons. So on to neuroglia. Uh, specifically, you have different neuroglia in the two parts of your nervous system. So you have different ones in the central and uh, versus the ones in the peripheral. So remember that neuroglia are those supporting um, cells that are going to support and protect your neurons. The ones that we want to talk about in the central nervous system include oligodendrocytes, which are going to form myelin sheaths. And go ahead and tuck this term away for the moment. We are going to come back to it. Next, we have the astrocytes, and the astrocytes are going to uh, maintain the blood-brain barrier, so you actually don't have any blood in your brain per se. Um, there's actually a barrier uh, that allows for certain things to move across um, and other things to not, um, and that just keeps certain things out of your brain that shouldn't be there, and we're going to talk about that later. Structural support of your neurons regulate ion and that should say nutrients and gases as well as to recycle neurotransmitters. Here we have an astrocyte. I think they're quite pretty. Um, I love this picture. I think it looks absolutely fantastic but this astrocyte here in the middle is quite gorgeous. Finishing up the neuroglia in the central nervous system, we have ependymial cells, which are going to line the ventricles of the brain. Uh, our ventricles are going to be basically empty spaces that are full of cerebral spinal fluid, which this is a very important fluid, uh, which surrounds uh, around our brain and spinal cord and uh, is essentially like the blood of your brain. Um, serves a very important purpose, quite a few, and we will talk about that here in just a little bit, but epidemial cells are going to create CSF. Last but not least for the neuroglia in our central nervous system is microglia. These are going to be macrophages. Macrophages are kind of like, um, I want you to think of white blood cells. White blood cells can be macrophages, and what that means is that they're going to uh, protect whatever area it is that they are designated to protect from uh, foreign items, whether that's damaged cells or microbes, bacteria, viruses, whatever it may be. 
Um, but what macrophages are going to do is they're going to find whatever it is that shouldn't be there and they're going to engulf it and get rid of it. Moving on to neuroglia in the peripheral nervous system, we have Schwann cells, uh, which are going to myelinate fibers of the peripheral nervous system. Satellite cells, which are going to support peripheral uh, nervous uh, system cell bodies. Moving on to our myelin sheath. So in the peripheral nervous system, you have hundreds of layers um, that wrap around our axons for, you know, that little talking piece of our neuron. So this whole thing here is our axon. And then here we have our Schwann cell, uh, which is something we discussed earlier, right? So the, this myelin sheath is going to cover our axon, but it's going to form by sections. And these gaps in between are going to be called the nodes of Ranvier. So these are called the nodes of Ranvier. Now the reason for a myelin sheath is to carry information quickly down a uh, down an axon and it also acts as almost an insulation um, so if you think about like an electric wire like maybe um, on a pole outside uh, going down the highway those electric wires um, those are going to have a protective sheath around them in order to make sure that that signal gets passed down very quickly isn't interrupted um, and is protected specifically. Moving on to electrical potentials and currents. So we are talking here about neuron communication and the fact that it's based on electrical potentials and currents. Um, we are going to talk about a few terms here. So the membrane potential, that is the difference in concentration of charged particles or ions. So this is whether or not a cell is more positive or more negative. And then current, that's going to be the flow of ions across a cell membrane. Um, so this could be potassium, this could be sodium. Those are the ones we're going to specifically talk about. We do have this term resting membrane potential. This is where you're going to have an unequal ion distribution and it will be maintained by selectively permeable uh, plasma membranes and then by sodium and potassium pumps. And this is going to use active transport. So if you need to go back and see what that term means, do a little refresher. But the take home message I want you to get from all of that is that neurons have a resting potential because the cell is at a state of rest, but when a stimulus or message comes through the axon terminal, the cell will turn positive due to the influx of sodium. Basically, the neuron is waiting for a charge from a stimulus. So at all times, it is waiting to be used, waiting for a message. Um, it's kind of like after a date waiting for the other person to send you a text. Uh, you're, you're just in that process of waiting. You know it's going to come, hopefully, and you're just waiting for that message to come in so that you can send that message on to the next neuron. So how do we generate a current? So as easy as it sounds, we are just going to move ions. Uh, that is going to create a current. Um, a graded or action potential. So we are just moving those sodium or potassium ions. The action potential is going to be a short lasting event in which the electrical membrane potential of a cell is going to rapidly rise and then fall. So as easy as it sounds, just that. The process of generating current is going to be called depolarization, repolarization, and hyperpolarization. Now, I don't need you to memorize this entire chart, but I would like you to take a peek at uh, what's sort of happening here. So we are sitting at a resting potential, which is pretty negative. It's a negative 70. 
And as we start to have depolarization occurring, we are becoming more positive. Once we hit that peak, though, we are going to start the process of repolarization, which is going to bring us back down to a more negative state. And it's actually going to pop a little bit below our threshold here and then even back out at around negative 70. And this is just for one cell uh, during this whole process of generating a current. The following are a few videos that I find very useful. Um, Crash Course is one of my favorite YouTube channels and also one of my favorite places to send you guys in order to uh, kind of understand a few of these concepts that might be a little bit more difficult um, as far as watching me explain it. Um, I find that Crash Course does a really good job of animating as well as explaining. So if this didn't make sense, a great place to go is going to be this video as well as the following video. Moving on to a little bit more anatomy, um, as well as a little bit of physiology, but we have to kind of do them a little bit hand in hand here. So we are going to talk about the brain next. First and foremost, you have the cerebrum. The cerebrum is going to be this structure here. Let me get a nice color. I like blue. We have the cerebrum. This is going to be the part of the brain that's probably the largest, um, depending on who you are, I suppose. But the cerebrum is going to be that main structure that's going to fill the skull. It does contain two hemispheres and four lobes. The cerebellum is going to be the structure just inferior to the cerebrum and a little bit posterior, so it's in the back of your head. The cerebellum is going to control your balance, muscle movement, and coordination. It's also uh, translating into little brain. Also, if you were a big fan of the Powerpuff Girls in the 90s, uh, you know the character, uh, Miss Cerebellum. Yeah, it doesn't seem like quite a clever joke anymore, does it? <laughs> Next, we have the brainstem. The brainstem is going to be the structure that's kind of shooting off from the bottom of the brain. This is going to have various parts of it that are going to control the, your uh, heartbeat, your respiration, swallowing, and coughing. And then something I want to discuss is the sulci versus the gyri within your uh, cerebrum. So a sulcus is going to be this depression through here. The gyri or gyrus is going to be this kind of uh, projected piece. So you have the sulcus, you have a gyrus. Okay, so make sure you know that. And if we unfolded all of those folds, uh, your brain would be about the size of a 16 inch pizza. It's kind of cool. We do have fissures. So we have this very deep longitudinal fissure here going down the middle, which is going to separate our two hemispheres. Moving on to the uh, lobes of the cerebrum. You have the frontal lobe, which is going to uh, be where you have voluntary movement, planning, organizing, and quite a bit of your personality is going to be found there as well. Another thing that can be found in your frontal lobe is your ability for impulse control and judgment. Um, so a lot of that has a little, little bit to do with your personality. Um, but that little voice that says don't do something or maybe you shouldn't, that actually comes from your frontal lobe. Next is your temporal lobe. The temporal lobe is going to be where you process auditory information as well as a little bit of your visual information. Uh, you also store memory and quite a bit of emotion in your temporal lobe. Although that being said, you have various spots in your entire brain where you are storing memories. 
Um, so if you remember something very specific having to do with uh, visual or um, maybe a very emotional uh, memory, you're going to store that in a different place, such as like your frontal lobe. The parietal lobe is going to be where you process touch and have self-awareness. And then last but not least, we have the occipital lobe here in the back. And that is where you're going to process uh, visual information. Here we're going to look at the anatomy of the inside of the brain. So if we were to cut down the longitudinal fissure, this is what we would see. The first structure we want to talk about is this corpus callosum. It kind of looks like a Nike symbol uh, moving on back. And it is the area where you're going to have communication between the two hemispheres. So if you cut through this, your right hemisphere would no longer be able to communicate with the left and vice versa. Uh, in some instances, this is a medical procedure um, for people who experience uh, extreme seizures and constant seizures. And if you cut this um, connection between the hemispheres, uh, you can essentially have the right side of the body do something without the left side of your body actually being able to know or process what the right side's doing. It's kind of interesting. Next, we have the thalamus. The thalamus is going to be this middle structure here. It's going to be the first to receive sensations such as pain, pressure, and temperature. It's going to suppress some and enhance others. I like to think of it as the mail room. Uh, so what I mean by suppress some and enhance others, it's sort of making the decision on whether or not to let you know what's going on around you. If you know what the term like nose blind means, you can kind of go physical blind. Um, right now, if you're wearing clothes, which no judgment, if you're not, you probably are hanging out at home. Chances are, if you're wearing clothing, you don't really feel it on you. Uh, through the day. Maybe right when you get dressed out of the shower or as you're getting ready in the morning, you feel that clothing kind of sitting on you, but after a while, you just don't perceive it anymore. Your thalamus is making that decision to not bother you with that information because it's not necessary anymore. Yes, you're wearing it, you were aware of it at first, but now that information is kind of old news, you don't need it anymore. Your hypothalamus, which it's just meaning under the thalamus, is going to be uh, where your control center for your sex drive or libido is. Uh, pleasure, pain, hunger, thirst. It's going to assist in your blood pressure and body temperature regulation. Um, this is going to be what controls quite a bit of your hormone release. Um, so specifically, it is going to tell your pituitary gland, so the structure just below it, uh, what hormones the pituitary gland needs to either release or what the pituitary gland needs to tell uh, another gland to release. So that being said, moving on into the pituitary gland, this is known as the master gland. It is going to produce hormones. Uh, as well as control other structures that release hormones. And specifically, it's going to receive those orders from the hypothalamus. Next, you have the midbrain, which is going to be this structure here. Um, and I know I don't have that labeled out, so this will have to do. This is going to adjust your sensitivity to light and sound. Um, so it controls a little bit of your eyes as well as your inner ear. The pons, which is going to be this first structure. I always like to think of it as kind of looking like a pregnant belly. Is a bundle of axons that it's going to act as a bridge between your brain and spinal cord. It also regulates your breathing. So chances are most of the time you don't think about breathing. But now that I've said you're thinking about breathing, you're probably like thinking about like, I have to take my next breath and exhale. Um, but normally you don't have to think about it. And specifically, like when you're unconscious, you don't think about breathing. Um, the pons kind of does that for you, as well as the next structure, which is your medulla oblongata. 
and this is an extension of the spinal cord. Again, it's still kind of a connection between your brain and your spinal cord, um, but is more of an extension of the spinal cord that's really close to your brain. This is going to control your breathing, digestion, heart regulation, sneezing, and swallowing. Within the brain, you're going to have two types of matter. This is also included in your spinal cord. So a cross section of your brain is going to show these two types of matter. You have gray and white matter. White matter is going to include myelinated axons or myelin sheaths. So the neurons within white matter are going to have uh, myelinated axons. In gray matter, it does not have myelinated axons. Uh, instead, it's going to have cell bodies, dendrites, and synapses. And so that is going to be the outer portion of the brain and the inner portion of your spinal cord, where the white matter is going to be on the outside of your spinal cord. So as all of this is uh, gray matter to white matter in your brain, it is the reverse in your spinal cord. Next up is the diencephalon and the brainstem. So these two terms, diencephalon and brainstem, is just talking about uh, regions of the brain that are going to include specific structures. So the diencephalon is going to be a cluster of gray matter that's on this kind of inner portion of the brain. So typically all of this. And it's going to include the thalamus, the hypothalamus, and the epithalamus, while the brainstem is going to be these structures right here, which is the midbrain, the pons, and the medulla oblongata. I do want to talk about each one of these a little bit more because I think they're quite important. Um, the thalamus is going to receive sensory information and integrate it and send it to the cerebral cortex. And this is the main thing that I want to get at here is that its major role is cognition. So this is your awareness and knowledge acquisition. Uh, it also plays a role in emotions and memory. Next, the hypothalamus. Um, its major role is to regulate homeostasis. Um, so it controls the autonomic nervous system, specifically controls the pituitary gland, uh, emotional and behavioral patterns, eating and drinking, body temperature, as well as your day-night cycles of sleep. And then the epithalamus. Um, this is going to include a very important gland called the pineal gland. The pineal gland is going to secrete something called melatonin. Now, you might be like, that sounds kind of similar to something we talked about before, which is melanin. Melanin is the pigment in your skin, your eyes, and your hair. Melatonin is a uh, hormone that you're going to release that is going to help you regulate your day-night cycle, which is called your circadian rhythm. So it's going to be a hormone that allows you to sleep. Next up, we have the midbrain, and honestly, you can kind of just ignore this. Uh, I just want you to know where it is. That's, that's it. Next is the pons. Uh, so this is going to be a relay center for the cerebrum and cerebellum. It's going to be sending signals to both from your spinal cord, and it also is going to be uh, your respiratory center. And then last for your brainstem is going to be your medulla oblongata. All ascending and descending tracks are going to pass through here. Um, it does have a cardiovascular center, a vasomotor center, and a respiratory center. Next up, we have the cerebellum. So that is that little structure that's on the back and underneath the brain, uh, or the cerebrum. And it has two hemispheres, just like the cerebrum. In the middle, you're going to have something called the vermis connecting the two hemispheres. It is going to coordinate uh, complex movements as well as regulate your posture and balance. Something kind of cool about the cerebellum is if you cut 
right down the middle of the vermis, you're going to see this structure on the inside. You can see gray matter or folia on the outside and white matter on the inside. And something kind of interesting about what this white matter on the inside is called, which is the arbor vitae, is that that translates into tree of life. So kind of pretty. Next we have the limbic system. Uh, this is going to include a handful of structures and their various functions. Um, some people have shown quite a bit of interest in, well, where in my brain do I do this? And where in my brain do I do that? Uh, so I thought I'd include a, a little bit of that uh, here. So the hippocampus is going to be where you have learning and memory. The amygdala is going to be where you have your flight or fight responses. Um, it's going to control your heart rate and emotional memory. The fornix is going to connect the hippocampus and the hypothalamus. The limbic cortex is going to be where you have memory and impulse control. The thalamus is going to serve the purpose of memory. And the hypothalamus is your autonomic and neuroendocrine and behavioral effectors. So remember that the hypothalamus is going to release hormones. Well, it also releases neurohormone, neurohormones. Try saying that five times fast. And that is just a combination of a hormone mixed with a neurotransmitter. Like I said, a lot of things serve double quadruple duty in a lot of places and sometimes you have things that are combinations of two other things so you can have a neurotransmitter that is also mixed with a hormone because they serve similar purposes and we'll talk about hormones more when we talk about the endocrine system moving on to ventricles remember i said that these are spaces inside of your brain there are four ventricles that i'd like to talk about and uh, specifically know that they are filled with uh, cerebral spinal fluid, or CSF. So you have the right and left lateral ventricles, which is this guy right here, and these over here, right and left. To me, they kind of look like a little spaceship moving back. You have the interventricular foramen, so this is just this little hole right here. So that's not actually a ventricle. Ventricle, it is just a hole. You have the third ventricle, which is going to be surrounding the thalamus. which it's a little bit easier to see it right here. I didn't circle it very well there. Then you have the cerebral aqueduct. That's going to be this little structure coming down here. And then you have the fourth ventricle here and here, which is going to go into something called the subarachnoid space. And we'll talk about that when we talk about the meninges of the brain and spinal cord. This is just another uh, view of those ventricles. Moving on to the protection of the brain uh, in the form of a cherry cordial, um, just a way to help you kind of visualize uh, how this would look, how it functions. So if the brain is the cherry, that is the point of uh, kind of starting with this analogy. So there are multiple methods for protecting the brain. The first is going to be your cranial bones. So obviously your skull, it's very hard. The purpose of the skeleton is going to be protecting the soft tissues underneath. Specifically, if we are looking at this as a cherry cordial um, example, it's that hard chocolate outer coating. The cranial meninges, which you have three, the, let me change colors here, the dura mater, 
the arachnoid mater and pia mater. They are thickest with the dura and thinnest with the pia. And uh, what some of these translate into is uh, tough mother for dura, arachnoid mater as spider mother, and pia mater, which just means little mother. I don't know why they chose mother, but it's just kind of a fun, interesting thing. The dura mater is going to fold into parts of the brain, um, kind of like a fitted sheet, and this serves the purpose of stabilizing and supporting the brain. Now, it's not a fantastic analogy here, but imagine that this chocolate on the outside that you can see are your cranial bones but the chocolate that's on this inner side, that is going to be the meninges. So it's a little bit of a thinner coating on the inside. And then we have our cerebral spinal fluid. Imagine that being like the juices that are inside with the cherry. Uh, it's going to support that cherry. It's going to kind of keep it moist. Um, that's the best analogy I can do. It also sounds really tasty, doesn't it? And then last but not least, and this doesn't fit into our analogy, but the blood-brain barrier. And we are going to talk about that here in just a second. If you don't have some form of protection around your brain, which is basically just a giant soft gland almost, um, not quite a gland because it doesn't release a whole lot, but it's just big and soft. Uh, it can cause something called a subdural hematoma. This is going to be where you have a collection of blood outside of the brain in the subdural space. This can be caused from severe head injuries. Um, if you had no skull, obviously this would be a very difficult thing to endure and also a very easy thing to have happen. Um, but bleeding and increased pressure on the brain can be life-threatening. So it's very important to, uh, if you have a head injury, if you hit your head on something, if you fall and hit your head, it's very important to see a doctor very quickly and um, potentially not go to sleep after something like that happens. Uh, because if you have a concussion, uh, it could lead to death, it could lead to a coma, it could lead to a lot of bad things. So head injuries are no joke. Moving on to cerebral spinal fluid. Um, it is a clear colorless liquid uh, that's going to contain oxygen, glucose, proteins, cations, anions, and white blood cells. You're going to find it in the subarachnoid space and the ventricles. And remember, I said that this is kind of like the blood of the brain. Um, one of the most important things that it's going to contain is that oxygen. Your brain can only go without oxygen for about five minutes before you have permanent brain damage. Um, so the cerebral spinal fluid is going to provide that oxygen to your brain itself. And how we do that is through the blood-brain barrier. This is a little barrier that is semi-permeable border between your blood and your uh, cerebral spinal fluid. It's going to protect your brain from harmful substances. It creates this tight junction of epithelial cells within capillaries, which capillaries are the smallest blood vessels that you have in your body. Uh, only about one red blood cell can fit through a capillary at a time. Uh, so things that can pass through is uh, water and fat soluble substances. This can include, like we said before, glucose, oxygen, carbon dioxide, and an interesting one is alcohol. This is why alcohol can affect you and impair your judgment, essentially. Uh, things that can't pass through are um, some proteins and most antibiotics. Um, and some of that might only be accessible uh, by active transport. Here we have the cranial nerves. There are 12. I'm not going to ask you to know all of them. I don't think that's uh, information you absolutely have to have. It's just sort of interesting to look at them 
Um, they are going to innervate uh, cranial structures and they're going to transfer different types of information. Some of these cranial nerves are going to be motor, meaning they are going to either be somatic or autonomic. Um, so they're either going to be voluntary or involuntary movements or um, functions is what they're going to control. And then some of them are sensory, and this can be general or special. Special senses are going to include your eyes, your ears, your nose, your uh, sense of taste, um, as well as your sense of equilibrium. So that's balance. Um, general sensory is going to be more like on uh, a scale of touch. So what's interesting about this graphic is that it's showing the cranial nerves that are going to be sensory or motor. And it's kind of cool to see which ones are which. Here we have a little bit of a simplified breakdown of various plexuses. And a plexus is going to be just a grouping of nerves. So do know that a plexus is a grouping of nerves, but I'm not going to ask you to know these groupings of nerves, at least for lecture. I may ask you to know this for lab. So this is just a nice little graphic simplified of uh, various nerves in your body. Moving on into uh, something that can go wrong. This is a term uh, that is uh, sciatica. Potentially you've heard of this. Hopefully you don't suffer from it but it's pain affecting the back, the hip, and outer side of the leg. And it is caused by the compression of spinal nerve roots in the lower back. So potentially nerves that you'll find somewhere in this region have been compressed in some capacity. Um, a good way to uncompress some nerves is chiropractor, uh, a chiropractor doing work on your back. Um, if you have pain like that, I would always suggest seeing a doctor, never leaving it uh, unanswered. You should figure out what's wrong. Dermatomes are kind of an interesting um, concept, I think. Um, it's where each spinal nerve contains sensory neurons that serve as a specific predictable segment of the body. So the way that this illustration is marked out is that nerves that you'll find here are going to have sensory structures that pick up down here. So specifically, it's sort of like the limb on a tree. If we think of how a tree is, we know that if we affect something here, that all of this out here is going to be affected. And likewise, what happens out here could potentially affect down here, right? Potentially, if we're speaking kind of uh, a little bit more analogous here. Um, so what we can see in how dermatomes can kind of affect the hand the median nerve is going to uh, have sensory nerves going down in this section as well as over here. And then the median nerve is going to be processing this information somewhere up here on the back. So it's kind of cool, kind of interesting. Moving on to the spinal cord. Um, this is going to lie within the vertebral canal of your uh, vertebrae. Uh, it will start from the foramen magnum and it will stop somewhere between L1 and L2. Your spinal cord doesn't actually go all the way down your back. It actually stops somewhere about here. You do have two enlargements, the cervical enlargement and the lumbar enlargement, but you can kind of ignore those. Um, it's just more interesting than anything. Here's a nice picture showing uh, all of these lovely terms. And then specifically where we're going to have that spinal cord stop, we have something called the conus medullaris and the cauda equina and the filium terminale.
The conus medullaris is going to be the point where the cord narrows just before ending. So you can see it making kind of a little cone shape. The cauda equina translates into horse's tail, and this is just a series of nerves coming off of the bottom here. They are a collection of rootlets, specifically, that combine to make the lumbar and sacral nerves. And the filium terminale is going to be a filament composed of pia mater that anchors the cord to the coccyx. So this is further down on this graphic. And if you need to see it, you can go to the last graphic. Moving on to a cross section of the spinal cord. You do have something called the epidural space. This is mainly a fatty cushion um, surrounding your spinal cord, at least on this uh, posterior side here. You have the meninges, uh, which um, just like with the brain is going to be layers surrounding the spinal cord. And if you get something called meningitis, chances are if you have lived on campus, are living on campus currently, um, you are going to need something called a meningitis shot. It is, um, I do believe, quite contagious. But meningitis is going to be inflammation of the meninges, so the dura, the arachnoid, or the pia mater, which if you need to remember those, they're right up here. Um, this is due to a virus or bacteria. The viral meningitis, you can live through, uh, most likely. You just have to write it out. There's nothing that can really be done. There's no cure for viruses. Once you have a virus, you have it forever. You just have to deal with the symptoms. A bacterial meningitis is very potentially fatal, and that is the scary one. Um, bacterial meningitis, once it's in your meninges, it can get into your brain, it can get into your spinal cord, it can be fatal. Uh, and then we, of course, have cerebral spinal fluid, which is going to be surrounding our spinal cord. It's going to act as a cushion as well as, remember, it's sort of the blood of the brain and the spinal cord. And uh, again, you're only going to find this in the central nervous system. A little bit about epidurals, um, just because they're quite interesting, uh, is it translates into above the dura. Um, so you are aiming for that epidural space to put the catheter. Um, it's a local anesthetic that's going to block pain um, while the patient is conscious. If you're unconscious, you probably don't need this done. Uh, when a woman is giving birth, this will be administered when uh, she is four centimeters dilated, um, but cannot be as administered after 10 centimeters. Here's a nice picture. I don't think I'm having you know anything. It's just a nice picture a little closer up. Much like with our notes over the muscles, um, I do want you to know a few things um, surrounding muscle uh, nerve fibers and uh, just the nerve in general, kind of the composition of it, because um, I think it's quite interesting to see this. Um, so remember that this is the axon surrounded by Schwann cells or myelinated uh, sheaths. So you have quite a few of those making up this fascicle here. Uh, surrounding and in between our axons is going to be the endoneurium. Then you're going to have that fascicle. And surrounding the fascicle is going to be the perineurium. And then these fascicles, multiple fascicles, are going to make up this nerve here. And surrounding the nerve is going to be the epineurium. I do like to color coordinate, and this does go in uh, order from largest to smallest. Just be careful of your phrasing here. So you have the nerve surrounded by the epineurium. Within that, you have multiple fascicles that are going to be bound together by the perineurium but do know that the fascicles are held together by the endoneurium. And then of course, those fascicles are then made up of neurons. So this next slide is going to be drugs and the nervous system. 
which if you were in a school that had the D.A.R.E. program, this is maybe going to be a flashback that isn't so pleasant. Um, I've always found that the D.A.R.E. program used fear a little bit too much in their teachings. Um, I think it's important to be more informed than anything. Fear shouldn't be a way to teach children. Um, it should be true information. So here, I'm not going to go through each one. I think you are perfectly capable of reading through these yourself. Um, there are one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight drugs that I want you to be aware of. I want you to know what it is and what it does. Um, and I want you to know the side effect. Um, one of the most important ones, and of course my little video is covering it up, is nicotine. Um, I think nicotine is one that I should clarify. Um, if you have these notes in front of you, you're taking notes, hopefully you can see this graph um, and see that it increases the odds of every type of cancer. I want you to make a note that I don't mean nicotine just by itself. I am meaning nicotine in the form of cigarettes. Um, nicotine just by itself, concentrated nicotine, such as through the consumption using a jewel or a vaporizer of some kind, um, that can still cause a lot of problems. But specifically nicotine just by itself, it's not going to cause what cigarettes can cause. So make sure you know that when I say nicotine as a drug, I'm talking about through the, the consumption of cigarettes. It can cause um, every type of cancer. So keep that in mind as you go through here. Um, it's quite interesting information, I think. Hopefully you get something from it. Moving on to diseases, disorders, and disabilities. Um, as far as the nervous system goes. First and foremost, probably one that we're all unfortunately aware of and maybe unfortunately have come into contact with with loved ones is dementia or Alzheimer's. Um, it is where the brain cells will degenerate and die. This is going to cause memory loss and altered judgment. Epilepsy is going to be brain activity um, becoming abnormal. Um, it's going to be burst of activity causing twitching or flailing, and it's caused by metabolic imbalances, toxins, infections, head trauma, abnormal, reverberating circuits. Kind of the list goes on over what can cause um, seizures specifically is what we're talking about. So this is abnormal synchronous discharges from many neurons. Um, and this graph over to the side here is an EEG of uh, brain activity before a seizure and then during a seizure, that brain activity is going to be very abnormal and very strong. Schizophrenia is going to be a loss of being in touch with reality, and honestly, the biological causes are unknown. Parkinson's is next. This is a loss of neurons that produce dopamine, uh, which is going to cause abnormal brain activity. Bipolar is... Um, a condition that causes extreme emotional highs and lows. It is genetic. Uh, it can be exacerbated during periods of high stress, traumatic events, and from drug and alcohol abuse. And then the last um, one on this page, at least, that we're going to talk about is multiple sclerosis or MS. This is an autoimmune disease that destroys myelin sheaths um, in the central nervous system. So this little uh, Illustration here is showing the destruction of those myelin sheaths. It can cause weakness in muscles, double vision, abnormal sensations. The cause is unknown, um, but some mixture of environmental and genetic causes may be what causes MS. And then last but not least is depression. Depression is a feeling of helplessness and despair, a loss of interest, crying spells, and thoughts of suicide or maybe thoughts of self-harm. Um, it is a disruption in levels of neurotransmitters like serotonin, norepinephrine, and dopamine. So a lot of times we associate these specific neurotransmitters as being our happy hormones. Um, they are chemicals that are going to be released to make you feel happy. Um, but during 
um, depressive episodes or being depressed or suffering from depression, uh, these chemicals are completely imbalanced and can cause um, a lot of pain emotionally. How you uh, receive depression, uh, genetically I suppose, can be mutated genes that lead to disruptions in uh, the chemicals I mentioned before. Antidepressants, uh, antidepressant medication, pardon me, block the actions of enzymes that degrade those neurotransmitters that I mentioned um, or inhibit reuptake. Moving on to brain and spinal cord damage. Um, probably the most well-known example is going to be the late, great Christopher Reeves, the original Superman. Uh, he was thrown off of a horse and had an injury in his C1, I think it was C1 and C1, C2, or C2, C3 vertebrae. So that's incredibly high up on his neck. So somewhere up here. So... As we've kind of talked about, um, these various sections of your spine are going to control various parts of your body. Higher up is going to control higher up, as well as if you have damage somewhere like here. Everywhere that's below there is going to be damaged. Once you block this flow of information, it's not going to go any lower. So if you have someone who is um, a paraplegic, uh, they're going to just have damage from roughly about the thoracic vertebrae down, meaning they still have control of their arms, but not control of their abdomen or legs. So do make sure that you understand that concept there. It's actually pretty amazing that Christopher Reeves was able to survive as long as he did, um, but he was a very cool guy. I do want you to know what traumatic brain injury is, and that is external force, which causes the brain to move inside of the skull. You can think of like a car accident for this. Uh, if you're going 60 miles per hour, suddenly your car comes to a stop, maybe hitting a tree or another car. Um, your body doesn't stop, and specifically the insides of your body are not going to stop. So whether that is your internal organs in your chest or an abdomen, um, a lot of times it's your brain. Um, so you're going 60 miles per hour, but your body suddenly stops. Your brain is going to keep going forward. And this can be, uh, this can cause a traumatic brain injury. An acquired brain injury is going to be pressure from a tumor or potentially an illness such as a stroke. Um, this can cause changes in personality as well as changes in uh, what that person is able to do, depending on what part of the brain is being um, damaged or affected. And then I like this question here, can neurons heal themselves? Uh, the answer is actually yes, just very, very slowly, and it doesn't happen very often, um, but the answer is yes. And something quite interesting actually is reading EEGs. Um, so this is reading brain activity. So this is where we have the brain lighting up in different spots, uh, explaining what is being sort of like activated in the brain. So where those neurons are firing, uh, we can see it in the form of lighting up as well as these different colors are meeting um, whether or not there's extreme activity in that area or none at all. So uh, I like this little explanation here. The brain contains billions of neurons arranged in patterns that coordinate thought, emotion, behavior, movement, and sensation. And as those neurons are being stimulated, we have that activation, which is that lighting up. That is also known as activity, right? Um, the term brain dead is where the brain is no longer working in any capacity and never will again. Um, this means potentially that other organs can still be functional as long as the body is hooked up to something that is keeping uh, the, the body regulated. 
So as long as the person is on some type of breathing machine, those organs are still viable, but only for a certain period of time after that person is declared dead. Uh, this is how we are able to donate organs um, and use organs that have been donated. Something kind of interesting, I think, when thinking about EEGs is dreaming. Um, potentially you've heard of REM, which is rapid eye movement. And this is where uh, the state of, of, of sleep, where your dreams occur, occur more vividly. Uh, what can happen here is that the brain is completely active when you dream. Um, so this middle uh, visualization here is showing a brain awake um, normal sleep and then REM. You can see how activated and how much activity is actually going on during REM. And then of course I love to get rid of uh, myths and old wives tales and just false information in general. Uh, I hate this myth so much and that is that you only use 10% of your brain at a time. In actuality you use almost all of your brain at any given point in time as long as you're alive. Uh, if you're not using parts of your brain, then there could be damage. Um, so I don't really know where that myth would have started. Um, because if you think of it this way, and it's a really trippy way to think of it. Right now, potentially, you are watching me. You are watching and reading the slide. So you are activating parts of your brain that are visual as well as audio because you're listening to me as well. You are writing things, hopefully, so you are processing the information and then transmitting it to write it down. Um, you're currently breathing, you're alive, you're thinking about what I'm saying, and now you're thinking about how you're thinking about what I'm saying, that you're thinking about it, and now your brain's probably just really hurting. It's a really weird idea and way to think about things, and we're going to stop talking about it because it's hurting me too. This is kind of a, a cool concept as well. Um, I was asked once, is there a difference between people's brains, like people who can hurt other people versus normal people? And the answer is actually yes. Uh, this is Dante Page. Um, he was a murderer and a rapist. Um, he went through a lot of traumatic things as a child. Um, from sexual abuse to mental abuse, his mother threw him out of a car multiple times and he received um, quite a few head injuries. From what you can see from his EEG versus um, normal people, uh, which they would have done EEGs of multiple people who weren't murderers, supposedly, allegedly, hopefully, uh, and they combine that information um, as an average. And this is what an average normal brain looks like, where it lights up in the front. Dante Page is on the left. You can see that he has little to no activity going on in his frontal lobe. That is where you have judgment. That is where you have um, your emotions, your personality, as well as your impulse control. He has none of those really going on, and a lot of that is caused from his upbringing, uh, his, his uh, trauma, both emotional and physical. Uh, so it's just kind of interesting to see that you really can influence um, a young person as they are developing to a point where they are more prone to doing criminal activity. Um, just just by their development as well as uh, throwing them out of a car. Something kind of interesting to think about, and I know I keep saying interesting, but I really find this part of uh, this, this lecture to be really just engaging, um, is right or left brain myth. Uh, and this is the myth that says that right brain people are more intuitive and creative artistic thinkers while left brain people are more quantitative, analytical, and logical. This is absolutely untrue. Some people are more inclined to be one or the other. Um, some people are a nice little combination of both, um, while others may not have much of either. Um, it just sort of depends. 
but it's not that you think with the right side of your brain or the left side of your brain more. Uh, you don't have more creative thoughts in the right side of your brain versus the left. Um, literally, the only difference between your right and left hemisphere of your brain is that your right side controls your left or your right side of your brain controls the left side of your body and the left side of your brain controls the right side of your body. So it kind of crosses. Um, that is the only thing that a right and left brain does. And then moving on to handedness, because I think this is quite interesting. Uh, it was my uh, master's thesis project. I always like talking about it. I'll always try to take the opportunity to talk about it when I can, because I'm quite proud of what I achieved. Uh, handedness is uh, classified as preferential limb use. Uh, it can also be called lateralization. The reason we call it lateralization is that many other animals aside from humans can show preferential limb usage. Uh, so fish, birds, reptiles, amphibians. Up here I have examples such as chimpanzees, beluga whales, hagfish, and garter snakes. Um, they actually have a preferential side or a uh, preferential, in the case of garter snakes, a uh, hemipenis. Um, so their penis is bifurcated and they prefer one side versus the other. So what's kind of interesting is that 90% of the human population is right-handed. That means 10% is left-handed or this term ambidextrous, meaning they can use both hands equally. Um, that there's no dominant hand. This is actually a result of having a right and left uh, hemisphered brain. Uh, this is the vertebrate brain. And for some reason, it was just an evolutionary development to have a preferential side. And maybe the evolutionary reason for it is when you go to stand up, when you take a step forward, you'll take a step usually with your dominant side first. So for right-handed people, typically that'll be your right side. For left-handed people, it'll probably be your left side. Uh, when you go to pick something up, you're going to pick it up with your dominant hand. So potentially this has developed due to uh, not having to sit there and make a choice on which, which foot should I step forward with, which hand should I grab this with, um, that type of thing. It's just kind of interesting. It plays back into your brain. And this was my uh, master's thesis, specifically using frogs. So this is going to be extra credit. Um, I did look at handedness in these adorable little amphibians. Uh, you can see this little male right here. This is actually why they are called uh, tailed frogs is because they have this little pseudo penis or fake penis. Um, that allows them to uh, reproduce with females in these fast moving streams that you're going to find in the Rocky Mountains. Um, I would tickle them uh, essentially, or I try to get them to remove this glove off of their head. Unfortunately, they didn't really care, which was quite adorable. Um, I made them jump. I turned them over and I recorded which side they would turn over or jump on. And um, what I found is that they were ambidextrous. They didn't care which side they had no dominance, uh, no dominant side. Then here, this is sort of um, the behavior of a basal aneurin. So they're a very old species. And what's different about this frog is they belly flop just like this little video shows. So he is belly flopping pretty hard. Um, normal frogs, frogs that are a little bit newer in their, their species, they will jump and then as they're mid air, they're going to bring their legs back in so that they can land ready to jump again. Um, this particular frog does not do that and it's probably one of the cutest things you've ever seen. So I'm going to let it play out one more time. We've got that jump. We're not recoiling our legs and we're just going to belly flop. That's all I've got for the nervous system. Uh, make sure you are ready with your notes for your quiz and your exam.